am Andrew Broussard and today I'll be doing a watercolor painting on an 11 by 14, 11 by 15, a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. Um, today, and I'm trying to get everything situated nice and neat, it seems to be a reoccurring theme with um, the beginning of these videos and I apologize for that. Um, everything seems to be shifting over a little bit in that screen. But I'm trying to get that full view. Um, these videos seem to be a long running work in progress with uh, little changes here and there. But anywho, so I'll be doing a watercolor tutorial today. And this one was something that I was thinking about, I guess when I was like half asleep. And it's kind of based off of the last painting that I had done where I'll be attempting to exploit to the fullest um, the lifting with a paper towel while utilizing a wet and wet technique. So what I mean by that is I'll be saturating very extremely this sheet of water and I'll do some wet and wet and then I'll start using a scrunched up um, paper towel to kind of give a technique over it. And I guess it would give a lesser effect of a technique that people utilize with saran wrap where I believe saran wrap is laid on top of a wet and wet paper and then left to dry overnight. However, I haven't tried it and I haven't watched any videos on it. So that's something I might explore down the line. However, I do have difficulty doing a painting or at least starting a painting, stopping and then starting it an hour or so later on. I like to utilize the fast and loose technique and get a painting done in one session. I also want to um, really explore lifting up with the paper towel um, on tree structures and grass structures, um, trunks and whatnot. And then I was also thinking about taking very light washes at the end and putting light washes in the foreground in the form of, um, or just light application of um, like tree branches and whatnot. I'm running low on water in my spritz bottle. So spritz bottle is good for just kind of wetting your palette and whatnot. Um, and it is good for moving and clearing and wiping areas. That might actually be something I should be a little concerned about. So let's pour a little water in here, just get a little extra just in case we need to really wet and swipe with the paper towel. So um, I do like to start these paintings off with letting the water soak in the page warp while I set up the palette and kind of think about my colors. Um, if you've watched my previous videos, you know that I have an affinity for the earth tones. I have raw sienna, burnt sienna, and uh, burnt on burner row. Which reminds me, I have been thinking about not so much yellow ochre, but maybe playing with um, raw umber. So I have some da Vinci raw umber right here. I just managed to grab that. And I wanted to maybe play around with that and see how that looks. Um, in some of the books by James Fletcher Watson, he started incorporating, and I think uh, time-wise, he started using um, the uh, burnt, the sorry, the raw umber near the end um, to kind of break up the monotony of raw sienna. So that might take place as well using that. However, when I look at raw sienna. Uh, raw umber. It's difficult going back and forth for those be for me. Sorry. Whenever I look at the raw umber that I put on my palette compared to the raw umber that he says that he used in his um, 
paintings that are demonstrated in books, his looks a lot lighter. So I'm not sure if there was um, washes applied or what, but there was definitely something that uh, I'm not able to um, ascertain yet. So it's something I'll go back and research and try to figure out. And I might be just looking in the wrong spots in the painting itself. So that's something I'll report back on, but we'll utilize that to see what's taking place. Speaking of earth tones, a lot of um, people seem to uh, either utilize raw sienna or yellow ochre. Uh, yellow ochre is more opaque and um, with the Ron Ranson approach, the raw sienna is um, more frequented, more utilized. Uh, I think just because of just the concept of transparent watercolors, it just um, seems to fit into that idea better. And utilizing that in a first, first wash, the raw sienna it um, it does help sit back further uh, within the, the field of vision than um, yellow ochre, but that's something we'll have to play around with down the line so we can put it in and then play with it. So that's an experiment down the line. Other experiments I wanna do is um, splattering in different stages so you guys can see the results and get you to experiment as well. But like I said, today's is going, today's experiment We'll be focused on playing with the paper towel. So the paper's wet, it started to um, buckle up, so we use the clips to let everything go flat. Use the back end of the brush or some people, especially if you have it upright, a vertical um, board, it's a lot easier to pull the paper. Mine, I lay flat. So we'll just put this in. Um, We'll put in a little bit of the alizarin. Nothing entirely planned just yet. Looks like I accidentally put Payne's Gray on top of my Ultramarine. So um, there is some Payne's Gray. So let me fix that on my palette. One thing I do is if I put the wrong color in the one, wrong spot, which if you have a... Um, a butcher pan, a butcher tray type palette. It's very easy to uh, maybe put something in the wrong spot. Um, you can just use that card to kind of pay, pick up the paint and move it. And I know watercolors in the beginning, I was um, frugal with them. And I'll talk about that for a bit while I kind of play around with this. With watercolors, there is a frugality that takes place where um, watercolors are expensive. They, they really are. But a tube really does go a long way. Um, with this fast and loose, loose approach, uh, Ron Ranson was a big proponent of um, the Cotman watercolors which have, um, I think really have come a long way since he had first started using them and nowadays really have a lot going on for them. And the prices are really affordable. Um, I utilize a mixture of cotton and Da Vinci brand and the Van Gogh brand. And I try to look at the price per ounce. Or is the price per milliliter? Price per milliliter. And with that, like this tube I've been using for quite some time and I always pour out some ultramarine every video. And maybe this is 10 to $15. Burnt umber, I always pour out every video and that's about um, like 10, $15 range as well. And if you minimize your palette, you can really uh, get a lot out of it with um, the pure paints and not have to really worry about 
getting the right amount on your brush and really the price and whatnot. Sorry, I'm kind of mixing things while I'm talking, so I don't know if that made much sense. Hopefully it did. But what I'm saying is if you're a beginner, you're going to experience that frugality. You're also going to experience wanting to have every paint tube in the universe and every color. And you'll read a lot of stuff about how you shouldn't. Um, and then you'll read about um, specific palettes that people have. Then you'll find artists that you like and you'll look at the palettes that they utilize and you'll incorporate that into what you have. And then you'll start finding which ones you wind up using more often. Then you'll wind up um, establishing a palette from there. Uh, it's like really just the, the nature of the beast. It's going to happen to everybody. Um, you know, uh, one thing is it's tax season. You know, it's a um, file your taxes. You know, people get tax rebates and whatnot. And, you know, you, you, you have students that you look forward to it and the money comes in, they want to get a car, they want to get a tattoo, things like that. And the money just burns a hole in people's pocket. And you advise them to, to save the money, you know, um, you should have money in a savings account. So if something happens. You know, it's just the, the nature of the, what happens um, in life. You know, if something comes up, you know, um, you have some sort of dental surgery that has to take place. Something that has to be paid out of pocket. You know, it's just um, part of life. But inevitably, you know, you give that advice. It seems like they listen and then they go out and spend the money and get the tattoos. Right. And most of us and myself included did the exact same thing when we got our first tax refund. We went out and spent it. We didn't put it into savings. So, um, what I'm getting at is despite the warnings <laughs> that people give, such as um, don't go out buy every tube in the universe, inevitably you'll probably wind up experiencing that. Or maybe you have already. And, um, and it's okay. You'll have a collection and it'll be fun. You can go back at some times and, and just experiment. I have yellow ochre. I haven't used that in quite some time, but just before I mentioned how, you know, at some point maybe we should utilize it and compare it to, um, the raw, uh, Sienna. I have that burnt umber. I, the raw umber I haven't used in quite some time, but you know, today I'm going to experiment with it. So, you know, have fun. Don't stress out. You're going to make purchases you'll re regret, but don't, uh, don't, don't kick yourself over it, you know? All right. So after I just rambled about <laughs> fiscal responsibility and how, it's very hard to maintain it and we all make mistakes. I'm just gonna take this scrumpled up uh, paper towel and just, just texturize the sky and see how it affects it. In previous videos, I've talked about if we lift that area and we wind up painting over it, the area in some spots that are darker will be wet while the areas that are lifted and whiter will be dry. And we'll get a mismatch of um, soft and hard edges, which adds kind of an atmospheric effect to it. Here, we're kind of just going over the whole thing to see how it would change. Okay, so we went very extreme. We gave a uh, consistent pattern, not a consistent, a kind of random pattern, but uh, it was, it was all over. It was a, what a homogenous covering, a blanket. One thing 
you do have to be careful of is that since we have a drying shift, this will all dry lighter, I believe. So let's do a little stretch here. We have a light source. Uh, we'll check our camera, make sure we're all nice and good with everything. Yeah, we are. We put in some distant foliage, but let's start working our way forward. Hmm, so what do we want to do? Let's, yeah, we'll do, we'll do something interesting. We'll um, kind of give a random pattern, like dump, dump, da dump, da dump, and put that in as trees. Like, what I mean is dump, dump, da dump, da dump, 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 da dump, dump, dump. dump. Okay, so I just put these trees in as a random pattern, really no thought taking place, but this gives us a variation in difference between it. And what you want to look for in painting and when you paint is var line variation, um, distance between object variation, and play with it. See how right here, these two have the same distance between them, and that kind of We'll want to offset that a little bit. Now, an issue with that is in nature, you'll have the um, organic variety that takes place. It'll be sporadic. Whenever you look at a really properly, beautifully manicured lawn, you'll see that they really want to push together and have that perfect pattern. And you as an artist need to decide, do you try to get that perfection and have that nice, perfect spacing between them? Or do you push it slightly to change it? And doing so, and, and I gear towards more pushing it slightly to change it, but um, doing so raises a lot of um, ideas. And this stems back to, uh, I guess it goes back to what critics might think whenever people discuss a book or a painting. Whenever somebody might just paint something just to paint and not have any thought process behind it, which is totally fine. People might write a book just to write a book and might not have any thought process behind it. And that would, once again, totally fine. But um, a sporadic can potentially give the impression of um, the wilderness, the wildness of nature. Having something where it's nicely manicured lawn and everything's a little offset might be showing how um, nature is trying to take over the influence of man. You might want to try to tell a story with those things. So kind of just keep that in mind that you um, rather than just painting just a paint you might be able to have fun with it and experiment and try to tell a story and what's the word anthropomorphic anthropomorphize I'm not I'm not a good at pronunciator not a good pronunciator pronouncer <laughs> um, where you kind of give life to an object. Um, and yeah, trees are alive, but you give it human characteristics of, um, you know, trying to overcome what it's dealing with and whatnot. So we put this in, I do want to do a little rigor work right here. And then we're going to play with the um, paper towel to see what we can accomplish. So it looks like we have a decent amount of um, wetness on the paper here. Here's a little variation of um, lines taking place. So we have a variation of value and a variation of distance between the two. So that kind of makes it seem more organic, more realistic.
Now, um, two things just came to mind. I can lighten, sorry, darken the the back further side of the trees, like this corner, because it's it's further from the light. It's going to receive less. It's going to be darker. Or I can experiment with lightening this side right up here. Um, meaning that sometimes you can change the area around something in order to um, achieve the effect that you want. If I want to darken this even more, maybe it might work by lightening this area up right here. Maybe that's the best explanation I can give about that. So, you know what? Just to put it in there, let's get some burnt um, raw umber. This whole video is just going to be a train wreck of me messing up which one I'm utilizing. Just want to put a little burnt umber in there. Raw umber, see what I mean? And just getting a little bit of wetness. Okay. So, taking our paper towel, let's lift where the light is going to shine the most through these or catch the most on them. And see how that affects it. I think y'all watching the video will be able to see the result better than I am in person. It just seems to show up better on the camera. The oil painters that I watch will use this quite a bit to soften things. All right. So now I want to work my way forward. And I'd like to do another line or layer of um, trees. I'm just mixing uh, burnt umber and Payne's gray. I think I just hit it right there with the brush. That's fine. Paper towel. Okay, so let's come up with a sporadic line of trees. Now, the distance between the trees is important, like I said before, but also the variation up and down vertically on where it sits is gonna be important. Are we gonna have a perfect straight line? Or are we going to have a little variation to it? And I think um, a little variation to it is going to be important. It shows the shape of the ground. And think about how these trees interact with one another next to each other. Uh, here I have a curve. Do I want to follow that contour of it? Do I want to push against it? Does this one wind up sitting behind that one and this one crossing in front? How does that cross look? Is that cross awkward? You want to kind of consider all these things whenever you're um, placing these objects. Okay, so I put them in. Give ourselves a little bit of the reflections down here. Let's um, give ourselves an object on this side as well. And I'll continue to work my way forward with this. So here, have um, two options. 
like I had mentioned before, I can take the paper towel and lighten what's closer to the light source. So here, I'm just gonna do a flat edge with the paper towel and pull a little bit on that side. And that's gonna be closer. I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but just um, get a little bit of variety. I'm not really stressing out too much about this. There we go. Okay, so I just played around. I caught some of the paint. You see how I pull it up and all that. I'm not stressing out about that. I'm going to take my rigger with Payne's Gray and I'll put it on the back side of these. And I'll try not to tr chase the whole trunk. I'll try to get spontaneity in that too. And we'll see how that all blends together. So we have a mid-tone that we originally put in with the hake. We pulled out a light and then we're putting in a dark. And since we're closer, we can catch some of these. So um, let's give these guys some life, some limbs. And I'm using that same mixture. I will probably want to also take a lighter mixture and put that in on top as well. Um, the the lighter, more watery wash for um, variety. I think I had talked about that in the beginning. And I'm really not too worried about the direction of these. Like, literally, I can look up. I'm looking at my light right now and just doing that. Um, it does feel a little weird. I could look up. I'm not looking at it, trying not to. But you really don't want to stress out too much about these guys. Reason being, let me put in some here. Reason being is, you know, we'll come over with some foliage. And then we can come back in and push things back and forth. So when I put foliage in, I like to dry the um, the end of the hake and kind of just pick up some pigment and get a textured effect. So you see how it's all kind of scary looking. Um, and kind of just put it in. You could kind of tickle it in and work with it in different ways. And you want to be careful of a repeated shape pattern, meaning let's just put it down right there. Okay, so I have that high concentration right there. See if I do it right here, we might get a repeated stamp effect. So you kind of want to vary that up. So it's a repetitive smushing but there's variety within it it's not um, hopefully it doesn't seem too redundant I'm gonna put these lighter since the more light coming through and we'll see what we can kind of lift because so we don't really have too much water in here we're gonna have some growth at the bottom. Okay, where was I? I do like scraping into trees to get that break in the pattern. And I think that's um, you know personal preference, something you might enjoy. 
we are quite dry, so I'm not sure we can lift up too much. So we might have to go on the darker side of these trees. So that is lifting up a little bit right there. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna take the rigger. This will be lighter. Yeah. And then we'll mix the dark for those darker sides that I had talked about. Kind of like that light shining through right there. What we can do as an experiment, wet, lift, and you know that light shining right through there might be catching those guys. You know, just to show you what can happen, what can take place. Um, I think with fast and loose painting, you 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 just want to let loose, but you also want to have. Con All right, that sounds a little silly. You want to let loose, but you also want to have control. <laughs> Meaning catching a little bit of that um, what was it buff Titan on there I can see it right there I don't want that to happen I'm gonna pull it up okay what I meant but what by having getting loose but having control what I meant by that was um, what did I mean by that I'm not a loss <laughs> just seemed like such a good thing to say at the time I guess um, know that you can't do something perfectly if you, if, well, if you utilize this te technique some people can sit there and paint stuff that look like photographs and they get accused of just digitizing like doing some sort of editing on a photograph and getting their results um, you know that you, you just you can't I don't think you can get that with um, fast and loose however know what you can control with what potential results you can have Meaning, I can take this wet brush, just with water, and I can push it right here just to diffuse this. I don't know the perfect effect that I'm going to get, but I get that more watery effect there. I'll have to come back with a better um, explanation of that statement in another video. <laughs> okay, let me take a little bit of my Burnt Umber, and Payne's Gray seems to be the award-winning combination lately to kind of add a little bit of density in these trees. A little bit on the far side, a little bit of variety. I'll leave it at that, okay. So let's just for fun, grab some of that raw umber, put that down in here, see what we can get to take place. Yeah, it just seems like a brown. I'm really not sure what to think of it. I wonder if we can mix it with a raw sienna. Let's see what happens. Maybe that's the purpose. Really not sure. I really don't see um, it on people's palette that often, so I'm just gonna have to do more research for you on that. So I'm gonna take the paper towel and I can 
texturize this. Remember, one of our goals for this one was just extreme texturing. Uh, unfortunately, I did pull out some of the shadows that have to be in here. And when I say have to, I think they help everything kind of sit in place and say that we have the light coming from this way, we have the darker on the further side and whatnot. Anyway, now I want some closer foliage, so I'm working my way closer. So let's get some tree trunks that are going to be very in depth. So I'm just using once again the burnt umber and the paint's gray. Let's let's throw some ultramarine in there for some variety. Now that we're closer. We're not going to have so many trees together and our trees are going to be a little bit wider. So that's just a little perspective aspect you want to keep in mind. Um, let's see. So we'll bring this guy up here. Help him sit in place. Cast a shadow. Where else? Let's get a little bit of a we'll contrast the edge right there. And we'll put this gentleman right there. We got a little friend coming off of him right there. That. I'm a little concerned about how wide that is, so I'm going to kind of spread it out as if it's kind of that growth, that ivy that can take place at the bottom of um, big old trees, especially in the forest. I think we have some good dark contrast. Let's see, let's do one more offshoot right here. Now, I'm gonna let that guy go off the page. Let us um, continue with our experiment of lifting along the side that is closer to the light. And then we'll see if we can get even darker on the outside edge and kind of give it a, um, three value kind of curve. All right, we can lift up in here a little bit We're in different spots. So the paper towel can be a very useful tool within painting. So I'm gonna have to go very highly pigmented. This is just using that ultramarine, Payne's Gray, Burnt Umber mix. One thing I, I want to avoid here is breaking up that awesome texture that I have for these uh, trunks. So Kind of just squiggling up. And there's going to be growth offshoots coming up around. That's kind of the area that I might, if you remember from the beginning, I wanted to experiment with light washers coming up to see how that would affect it. Looking at it now, I'm not sure if I can do that but we'll see I want to come off here so let's put their branches in first and we'll come and address that stuff later on just think about how branches in general go from um, thicker to thinner uh, you can get perspective aspects of it, but you really want to 
practice that where a branch coming toward you is going to get bigger and you can get some depth taking place but just because that's happening maybe doesn't mean you should do it necessarily like um, make sure you, you you practice that and really get that point across um, an example of that is in a life drawing and painting class if the figure is laying with their feet facing you their the foot being closest is going to be it's going to seem way larger than the um than the rest of the body it's going to seem very awkward and trying to draw it um if you've taken an art class, you might have experienced that. You might know what I'm talking about. Um, I wish I had a picture representation of that that I could show you all. One thing that's been getting me, this painting, that I need to address is I really don't have much connectivity back here. So I want to bring this over. Sorry, that's just something that's been kind of hurt me a lot looking at that. Um, I think it's a mistake that I had made a lot in my earlier painting or something that I could have done better, meaning where I could have a cohesion taking place. But I use that word twice in that video, this video. I could use the back of the um, rigger to push. If you do wind up doing what I did, uh, what I talked about with um, trees and trying to get perspective and having branches coming down towards you and getting thicker as they come and change, you might want to pull areas out of that and lighten areas with it, like the knobs that would catch the light. So I think that would make some for some very interesting tree studies and tree portraits. So find a picture of an oak tree and, and try that out. And the best thing about it is, is that trees themselves will be easier to paint than drawing a person. If you, if this branch is supposed to be here and I put it right here, that's fine. You know. It, it really doesn't seem to change it that much. However, somebody's some shoulder is supposed to be here, and I put the shoulder down here. Now we're going to have a problem. So, you know, keep that in mind. One thing I always like doing is taking that rigger and putting little dots in on the end of these, as if we had a little bit of um, leaves holding on. kind of just near the end stage of this painting we could pull a little bit more add a little bit more variety in fact let's get good old dark concentrated mix that same dark mix I've been doing I just don't want to accidentally get um, too much of an ultramarine push which is a tendency for me where it doesn't seem to mix well. I'll try to get that to sit a little bit closer while lightening up some sides of it. The difference is subtle. With the lifting and I think a tree portraiture the tree study will um, give us some interesting results so that might be something down the line a tree study and we'll do the lifting with um, the paper towel
Uh, let's see. I'm going to stand up. Scrape some interesting spots. I had talked about that with the wet regular. So let's try that. I may need to do a dry off first so we can see what's happening. Okay, so here's a dry off if you have headphones on. Watch your ears. So, the watery, lighter mix, kind of like what I had put in right here earlier for the background, I was curious how it would look on a foreground type image. So I'm going to put it in right there. The reason I had thought about this was that as the object gets higher into the sky, it might catch more light around it and it might um, change a vari variation where we'd have a darker stalk and a lighter um, come on, coming off of it. There might just be too much going on. It might be too busy of a painting to really see that effect. But it, it might hold some viability this might be something I'd need to try um, with, like I said, a less, a less busy painting where it's more um, just more of a just one figure. Here, I have the darker branch and I put the lighter off of it. That lighter does help kind of catch that light around it as well as um, give us a forward backward depth the darker leaning more towards us the lighter potentially pushing away so that gives good tonal variety over that lighter area so that's a good experiment right there so if you follow along or you're doing a, a painting I want you to try putting in some of these light washes and seeing how it affects your view and your perception of what's going on. And like I had done that light wash in that background, it's never too late, I think, in a painting to put something in the background there. So overall, looking at it, um, since we're experimenting and I want to show you all possibilities that I can think of, this is something we did earlier on that middle ground. I just put water right there in that trunk. Let's see if I can lift anything. I didn't really seem to get much. We might have to switch paper towels. Let's, um, let's try that again. Wet right there. And I'll see if we can lift. Yeah, so we can pull a little bit. This is where the pigments will affect it. Um, so pigments are, I think, with staining, where they're harder to lift. I don't think I'm using any staining pigments. I might just not be um, waiting long enough to do it. But it's a useful technique, wetting that spot and lifting it out. Uh, Stephen Cronin has an example of it where he uses it to gently lift out a um, sail on a sailboat, you know, just a white sailboat, which is really nice. So that adds a little bit more dimension to the painting. And, you know, with, with the fast and loose, 
you could think of this as tickling potentially at this point. However, um, I'm just kind of picking out an area where, okay, this might have a lighter aspect of it. So I'm going to just see if it gives me a little lighter tone on it. And I'm not um, going to spend all day doing that. I'm just picking out a few spots just to add that uh, variation there. So to sum it all up, the paper towel is a great tool in painting. We did this one with a hake, a rigger, the back of the rigger for a little bit of scraping in here, the card, and the paper towel. So let's do a little dry off and we'll see if we can put a little mat over it. Feels like most part everything's dry. We'll sign it and we'll put a mat over it. Let's sign it. Uh, signature placement always seems a little awkward. Clips off. Pop this on top. And I'll pull this out of here and I'm going to put this picture at the beginning for you all to see. Well, I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, I have a whole bunch of links down below Patreon, Etsy, um, Instagram, um, whatnot. Feel free to follow along with this painting. Feel free to post your results. Let me know how you did ask questions, leave comments, anything you'd like me to do differently or any topics you'd like me to approach, feel free. All right. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great night.